Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you once again for joining us at the LaSalle Sustainability Lecture Series. And this is our fifth lecture in the series. To start us off, I would like to call on Ms. Remian Santos, who is the current director of the Sustainability and Inclusive Education Office of De La Salle Lipa, to give us the opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Doc uh, Kathleen, for the introduction. So um, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome everyone in this sustainability lecture series and make some introduction about our school, De La Salipa. Actually, in the recent years, De La Salipa, through the direction of our brother president, Brother Dante Amisola FSC, we have taken a more deliberate and uh, sustainable approach to achieving our commitment to give Christian and human education to all by aligning first our strategic directions to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. When we talk of sustainability here at DLSL, our main trust is to encourage all our school stakeholders, be it learners, educators, and partners like you, to embrace the social, economic, and ecological aspects of our academic and operational policies and processes towards global sustainability. Uh, to put meaning and substance in what we do, DLSL crafted a sustainability framework with dimensions and phases that guides our actions and sustainability initiatives shared and cascaded to all school stakeholders in the community as well. Currently, we have joined two uh, international sustainability organizations. One is a UK-based one, which is the Environmental Association of Universities and Colleges, the AAUC, and one is a US-based org, the Association for Advancement in Sustainability for Higher Education, or AASHE. These two organizations inspire us to lead sustainability transformation in higher education especially here in the Philippines. In fact, uh, mid last year, uh, DLSL was recognized as one of the finalists to the AAUC International Green Gown Awards in three award categories. This is where we feature our activities and projects that showcase our commitment to conservation of our environmental, uh, environmental resources as well as the reduction on carbon footprint. Not to brag, actually we highlighted on the award categories, the initiative that almost 80% of our electricity mix at the school comes from a renewable, of course, evidently validated by a certificate from the Carbon Reduction Institute. Just this year, DLSL was recognized as a signee in the SDG Accord along with the 216 colleges and universities all over the world. As an SDG signatory, we are committed to do more to deliver the SDGs to report annually the progress. And of course, share our sustainability experiences with other learning institutions, both nationally and internationally. Also to date, um, we are on our road to the first sustainability assessment and tracking system known as the AASHA STARS rating, where we earnestly aim to be a sustainability rated institution in the coming school year. Up to this endeavor, we'll enable our institution to create our uh, sustainability effort baseline for continuous improvement to be shared to other peer institutions. We all know that planning for sustainability is an evolving practice, a commitment that starts within ourselves, a change in behavior that leads in change in lifestyle, forming a person to make connections to community during uncertainty and risk. But of course, with decisions and actions guided by our mission and reflective of our current school resources. Uh, allow me aligned with the objective of this uh, organized lecture series. Let me share the Pope's uh, recent encyclical, the Laudato Si, or the care for our common home, which we are called to tackle the current ecological crisis by making a paradigm shift that will allow us human beings to live sustainably in dignity. 
I encourage you all, our dear stakeholders present at this um, lecture series, that we should all play our part by where we see it, by setting an example or by advocating sustainability in our life. We thank you for joining us on this. We appreciate your participation and I hope that this lecture series on social innovation story will be meaningful to everyone. God bless and uh, stay safe. Thank you, Doc Kathleen. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Remian. Now I'd like to call on the Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation of De La Salle University, Manila, to give us a few words. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you'll allow me to give a few words about the lecture series itself, I'll bring up my slide and spend maybe a minute describing this lecture series. Uh, this is an initiative which is based on our commitment to sustainability. This is a commitment that DLSU made in 2015. We added the phrase attuned to a sustainable earth to our mission vision as a, a way to, to strengthen the phrase green university. This is also an initiative which is being undertaken in cooperation with the International Association of La Salle Universities, where the LSU is represented by Chancellor Emeritus, Dr. Carmelita Quebenco, who is with us this morning. And the intent of the lecture series, uh, which has started during the lockdowns, was to rally the global Lasallian community towards a common concern, which is a, the care for our common home. And of course, the lecture series is inspired firstly by the Pope's uh, 2015 encyclical, which is intended to, uh, to wake up the Catholic uh, world towards being more concerned about uh, taking care of the environment and ensuring that there's uh, equitable quality of life for humans all over the planet. And similarly, we have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, 17 goals which are bounded uh, and uh, time bound. That is uh, that in 2030, we need to address 17 major aspects of a sustainable planet. And this is work that's being undertaken throughout the world by different universities. Certainly the Lasallian universities throughout the, uh, throughout the network of IALU are involved in various SDG related initiatives. And one of those which is intended to be a venue for sharing various activities taking place in the Philippines, in different parts of the world is this sustainability lecture series. And the plan for 2021 is to have 12 lectures. So we're now on our fifth lecture, which are to be Zoomed, uh, or rather streamed via Zoom so that we can have a live audience. And uh, when time zones make it inconvenient to have live audiences, then we have a YouTube uh, parallel stream, which is also recorded and can be viewed on a delayed basis. So some of our previous lectures have had hundreds of views since they were uploaded uh, soon after they were given live. And the talks, of course, are highly diversified. The only common theme is sustainable development. Uh, the key that we're trying to achieve in this lecture series is to get more volunteers from different Lasallian universities so that we get full representation of the, the global family. And we may even have panel discussions in the future. And uh, finally, this is being hosted by De La Salle University's Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research. Uh, Dr. Alvin Kolaba, the director, is unable to join us this morning, but he's represented here by our MC, Dr. Kathleen Avisa, to whom I'll turn over the floor once again to introduce our distinguished speaker for this morning. Thank you, uh, and good day to everyone. Thank you. Um, fortunately, Dr. Alvin Kolaba is already here. Um, so may I request Dr. Alvin Kulaba, Director of the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research, to introduce our speaker for this morning. 
thank you uh, very much. Uh, apologies uh, for unable to connect, uh, you know, to, to this uh, forum. Anyway, uh, welcome everyone. Um, as mentioned by Professor Raymond Tan, in the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research, which has been established back in 20, uh, 2003, no? has been undertaking uh, uh, sustainable development uh, studies uh, that has actually addressed many of the sustainable development objectives, uh, you know, not only those that apply to the Philippines, but uh, also apply, uh, you know, to anywhere, you know, in the world. And uh, to date, uh, we have actually published uh, over 6,000 uh, 6, uh, Scopus indexed uh, publications related to the subject, uh, which is a product of the many uh, senior scholars and scientists of the center, which have, uh, you know, which have addressed many of the SDGs. And uh, this morning, uh, we have uh, the privilege uh, to hear another Lasallian who's going to share uh, his uh, work uh, in this uh, sustainability lecture series. And he is the managing director of Nexus Innovations Labs of Del Sal Lipa. He's also the co-founder of the Yellow Boat of Hope Foundation and chief panda of IMVR Panda and several other technology startups. He sits on the boards of the various organizations in the country and consults on disruptive technologies, resource mobilization, and social innovation. Our speaker loves to help people, companies, non-profits, and brands breathe life into their brand story. He's a hungry man. He eats at least 100 books a year, loves chocolate, and sometimes cannot live without coffee. He has worked in sales, marketing, and management roles for organizations as diverse as the Office of the President of Procter and Gamble Philippines, Australia and New Zealand Banking Group Limited, including Metrobank Card Corporation, Acumen, a nonprofit social impact fund in New York, and Philippine Business for Social Progress or PBSP. Ladies and gentlemen, let us warmly welcome Mr. J. Michael Haboneta. Jay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Doc Alvin, uh, for that uh, introduction. Of course, uh, thank you to uh, Doc Kathleen, uh, Sir Raymond, uh, for this invitation to speak here. Uh, and of course, thank you to uh, Doc Anna Re Resurrection, who I think recommended me. Uh, and of course, good morning to everyone. Uh, again, let me just share my uh, screen. I hope you're all uh, having your coffee. As uh, was mentioned, uh, I love my uh, coffee uh, and uh, I can't live uh, without it. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, when uh, Doc Kathleen first invited me, um, uh, I wanted to you know, make it very light uh, since it's early in the morning. Um, and so basically, I'll be talking about uh, you know, the organization that I co-founded uh, now almost 11 years ago. Um, in the south of the Philippines, but of course, uh, uh, today we're nationwide. Um, so Siguru, uh, just a bit of background. Um, I joined, uh, because of this project, uh, I was, uh, you know, introduced to, through the innovation, uh, innovation story in La Salle. Um, so just a, a bit of a background story maybe uh, before I start no, the, formal, uh, the formal sharing on Yellow Boat. Uh, I think it was uh, 2010 uh, when uh, we first started this project. We weren't registered at the time. Uh, we registered officially uh, as an organization around 2012. Uh, but I think when we started uh, a year after that, uh, there was there was someone. Uh, I, I I know everybody's familiar with Facebook. Um, there was someone that kept liking all our posts. When I posted something, he immediately liked it. And so, uh, you know, one time I, I reached out to him and I messaged him, sir, uh, thank you very much for your support. Uh, we, we are very grateful for uh, you always liking and sharing our posts. Uh, 
and that was 2011 and then i i told him uh, may i know more about you and I, his name is antonio ingles and he's actually a, a theology professor at uh, de la Salle college of saint benil uh, i think now close to 20 years um and uh, you know he he invited me to give a a, a talk uh, in benil and uh, i gave a talk to i think seven of his uh, theology classes uh, and after that, you know, the students uh, donated boats uh, instead of, you know, uh, having a Starbucks uh, for that day. Uh, they chipped in. Uh, later, I'll show you the photo of the boat that uh, one of the classes donated. Um, and so, and then, you know, when the admin at the time uh, found out about it, uh, I believe Brother Dante was uh, uh, the vice president there for advancement, uh, who's now our president at Tela Salipa. Um, and, you know, we got into talking about social innovation, how schools can, uh, you know, sort of participate in, you know, consciously uh, creating or developing social innovation. And then, you know, because of those conversations, uh, the Benil Prize uh, came about. Uh, and of course, now, uh, I think some of you are familiar with the Hub of Innovation for Inclusion, uh, which is, uh, you know, a social incubator. Um, the LSU has uh, LSEED. Uh, and also Animal Labs. And of course, now at, Nex uh, at De La Salipa, we have Nexus Innovation Labs because we realize that, uh, you know, so part of our work, uh, we realize is that it's very important for us to achieve the, as uh, doc, uh, Dr. Raymond uh, shared earlier, uh, for us to achieve uh, the UN SDGs, uh, the schools, the, the, the academy must play its part. And, you know, it got me into thinking that, um we spend uh you know our students including you know us uh, whether teachers or admin staff we spend like eight hours uh you know eight to ten hours every day on in school um and can you imagine if we can harness that towards you know creating solutions and that's that's for me you know the capstone projects of students the research projects they can really be organized in such a way that you know they could lead potentially to solving the any of the un uh, 17 un sdgs um so that is the context of my sharing this morning uh so let me start now that that was just the background there um there so uh, 11 years ago uh i uh, i went to sambuanga city so i'm originally from uh, I'm not sure if uh, well, everyone is familiar with the geography of the Philippines. So we have seven uh, thousand islands, uh, and I I came from I came from Mindanao, uh, from Cotabato City, and um, I was already working here in Manila. But ten years or eleven years ago, uh, I was invited to speak in Samuanga City. Uh, I was in uh, you know social media marketing at the time and. Uh, the bloggers of Mindanao, because you know uh, when you search Mindanao, uh, most of the search results on Google or the search engines would you know would point out to articles about you know the the conflict there, uh, you know uh, sort of negative stories. And so uh, in uh, around 26, 2006 or two thousand seven, the bloggers in Mindanao from you know Davao, Iligan, Sambuanga, etc., they banded together and you know they sort of had a loose association wherein. Let's start blogging about you know the good things about Mindanao, uh, and so they invited me eleven years ago, um, and you know I spoke about how uh, social media and you know all these new digital tools can be used uh, for nation building, uh, but I never imagined that you know I would pick up a story there uh, that would you know sort of. Uh, make me live out, uh, you know, the the advice that I was giving that you know we can uh, use these tools, these digital tools to create change. Um, so let me proceed. Um, so uh, I think where everybody is familiar with uh, with this story, it's not unique to the Philippines. Uh, there are you know we, we always hear of stories about children, you know, having to walk uh, maybe you know a kilometer, two kilometers to get to school, an hour, two hours uh, of walking just to get to school. Um, there are children in China who have to go through these cliffs uh, every day uh, to get to school, and so you know all across the globe we we see these stories on a daily level. But it was a story uh, in, in, in Sambuanga City that uh, sort of disturbed me and inspired me. Um, and so on the sidelines of the uh, Blogger Summit that I was uh, also keynoting in 2010, 
uh, one of the participants came up to me after uh, my talk and told me that they went to uh, a year before that they went to this village called Dayagleag. Uh, so if you can imagine it, uh, you know, most of the Philippine cities are coastal cities. And uh, so Dayagleag is a sort of a mangrove part. Uh, mangrove forest part of uh, Sambuanga City. And, um, you know, during the last uh, 20, 30 years, because of the uh, infighting in Basilan, in uh, Holosulu, uh, a lot of the Bajaus and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the indigents lived, uh, transferred through the shores of Sambuanga City. So I think that's a, a stretch of 70 to uh, 90 kilometers where, you know, you, you would see houses on stilts. Um, and so this uh, participant, Jul Jimar Gonzalez, and his friends went there, I think, on a, uh, you know, on a uh, donation uh, giving uh, uh, activity as well. Uh, but it was uh, the way it was shared to me that at the time, uh, it was around this time, 7 a.m., uh, and uh, they were on a boat. And they encountered a group of kids uh, who were swimming. And at that time, uh, I was really surprised because the way they described it to me was that the kids were carrying, you know, uh, something on their uh, one hand and they were swimming with the other hand. Um, uh, and so basically it was a plastic bag. And so Juljimar and his friends asked, what are you doing? Uh, and the kids said, we're going to school. And that's when they realized that the kids were actually carrying their uh, either they wrap their school bag in a plastic bag or they, you know, their school supplies like notebooks, uh, pencils, etc. They wrap it in the plastic bag so it doesn't get wet. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 I've lived, I think up to this day, I've lived half of my life in Mindanao. Uh, and I thought I'd heard of all these uh, stories of the struggles of kids uh, who have to go to school. But it was the first time that I heard of a story where kids have to swim to school and so um later on that night on my uh, uh when i went back to manila i just kept thinking uh about the story and you know i couldn't sleep and so you know that was uh 2010 that was uh, facebook and all these uh, new tools uh like blogging twitter were new um but i just felt i needed to get it off my chest and so i shared uh i saw my facebook account uh I, uh, you know, I type a two-liner. Uh, I just came from Sambuanga City, and I heard of this amazing story where kids have to swim to school. Um, my objective at the time was really, you know, maybe someone will hear about it and some someone will do something about it. But to my surprise, um, the next day when I woke up, a lot of my friends started commenting, how can we help? How can we help? Uh, how can we help? And one of them, you might know him, um, his name is Josiah Go. Uh, so he's considered, uh, you know, the marketing guru of the Philippines. Immediately uh, pledged five thousand pesos, and he actually uh, shared, uh, sort of, you know, he asked his friends as well to donate, and that jump started uh, what was then known as the Sambuanga funds for little kids, because you know it was a little fund uh, for these kids, um, and within one week we were able to raise seventy thousand pesos. So, you know, at the, uh, today we have a lot of these stories of, you know, uh, especially after disasters, you know, after Yolanda, after all these other uh, super typhoons, um, there's a lot of fundraisers on Facebook. But at the time, we were probably one of the, the first uh, to really, to, uh, who were able to really maximize, you know, a digital platform to raise funds. Um, but you have to remember, up until the time, I haven't really seen the community. And so... Uh, I called uh, my other friend, his name is Doc Anton Lim. So he's with the Chuchi Foundation uh, in Sambuanga City. And I told him, Doc, uh, you know, we, we've gotten a lot of pledges and donations, but, you know, I haven't really seen the community. So can you first check, go there and, you know, sort of verify the story first um, before I collect the, 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 the pledges or the donations? Um, and so he went there, he talked to the principal, he talked to the parents. And um, we sent we sent the we sent the funds. Um, and the beauty of the story is that you know he he Doc Anton used to be a, a he was a past president uh, of the Rotary Club of Sambuanga City. And so you know the in a way Nahia or uh, you know the the people there uh, the Rotary Club there the business community there felt ashamed that you know the fundraiser started out of Manila and so they did their own fundraising um, and then. Uh, we started brainstorming. So we created a Facebook group. 
uh, and uh, you know we asked, we added members of the community, those who donated, those who uh, expressed interest to help, um, and we brainstormed uh, one of the. Uh, you could say that it was like you know a, a human-centered design process or a design thinking process. So we we asked uh, the community what we can. Um, you know what we can do for the kids. Uh, someone suggested, why don't we re relocate them? But of course, uh, you know the 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 indigent's uh, main livelihood is really seaweed farming and fishing, and so you know we can't take them really out to the you know to the mountains where where uh, a lot of the free land by the LGU were available. Um, and then someone said, why don't you build? the bridge um, but uh, we all know the bridge uh, you know would cost probably you know in the uh, in the millions and you would need to cut uh, the mangrove trees and you know someone suggested why don't you just give them a boat that's exclusively you know for like a school um, and so that's how this the idea behind this uh, yellow school bus uh, on water was born and so uh, five months after uh, so that uh, I posted that Facebook status around October 30 2010 uh, in March 2011 uh, I went there to give the very first uh, yellow boat um, and as you can imagine it's really you know it's a it's a simple it's a really a simple concept so it's in a way it's innovative because um, it's an you know we 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 sort of combined uh, you know the the yellow school bus concept uh, and then we applied it in a different field which is water um, and so the way this works is that uh, we donate the boat either to the barangay or to the school um, and because sustainability of the uh, you know enterprise is important or the project so they have uh, it's the barangay who assigns uh, you know a driver and they have a budget for the gasoline expenses uh, or in other areas it's the school that sorts of uh, you know is able to uh, get a budget for the driver and for the gasoline expenses so you know when i first went to uh, layag layag uh, uh, we uh, we we encountered this were we were thinking there were 20 kids who needed the boats but those were just the 20 kids who swam to school because they wanted to you know get an education and so when i went there we realized that there were around 200 kids uh you know that uh you know that weren't going to school and so we you know but they wanted to go to school and so we went back to facebook we raised funds and we gave them uh more boats uh which are yellow school boats and you know after that uh, uh story went viral uh, i got another call from masbate and so we we opened up there and then uh, other parts of uh, the philippines including cotabato my hometown uh, because of course some kids have to uh, you know traverse rivers um and so that became sort of the the focus of the the yellow boat at the time we were Sambuanga funds for little kids and then we created masbate funds for little kids and then when i think there were more than 10 communities we just said philippine funds for little kids but when we were uh, re registering with the sec uh, we found out there are a lot of other organizations that started with the word philippine and so we said maybe let's find a more you know unique name and we asked the 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 facebook groups again that we created and they said why don't we just call it yellow boat because you know that's what we're calling the project anyway and so that's how uh, it became known as the yellow boat uh, of hope foundation and you know the funny thing about this is that um when we we asked the community what to name the boats and they all said bagong pag-asa and that's how uh, because that's what it means for them so that's how it came about that uh, there's yellow boat of hope and all the boats now uh, carry the name uh, bagong pag-asa which means uh, uh, translated in english is new hope um so it made me realize and uh that's the fair uh, the, that's the first uh, sort of lesson that i wanted to share this morning that you know a single facebook status can make a difference so in fact over the last 11 years facebook themselves have given out uh grants to us uh, i think twice or thrice already um and so the lesson here is really that you know, with all these digital tools available to us, I realize um, it's not just we're posting, you know, when we're, when we're on vacation or we're eating something nice uh, or, you know, we meet a celebrity, but we can use it, um, you know, to sort of create awareness, to create change uh, in our own little communities. Um, and again, the technology uh, can be used to make a difference in the lives of others. 
Um, so before I continue, I'll share this uh, video with you. So to bring you there in Layag Layag uh, 10 or 11 years ago, um, just so you see how the actual condition was. Um, it's not the figures in the video are not as updated, but uh, this is, um, you know, sort of our founding video. And I just wanted you to, to understand it from that perspective. always hear of kids in Manila who skip school to go swimming but here were kids who go swimming so that they can go to school. The common stories we hear are them walking across mountains sometimes you know uh, they have to cross rivers but not to the point of getting themselves wet waking up very early in the morning just to be able to attend school. Pumapantay kami sa school, napabasa lagi kasi naglilangoy. Kasi walang bangka. Ang, tat ang tatay namin nag ano, sa loud. Mahirap pagkatapos mo sa yung paa namin matatama ng bato. Pagkatapos masugatan ng taba. Kung hindi po ba ang tatay namin sa loud, wala kami ma makain. Nababasa po yung bag niya, tsaka yung mga notebook, paper. Tapos pag hindi mo naman nilalagay sa plastic yung mga gamit nila, binibilad na lang sa araw. Na-experience namin, hindi kami nakatapos, nahirapan kami. Kaya gusto namin ng anak namin makatapos para naman sa kinabukasan niya yun eh. Una-una sila papasok, paminsan din pag high tide, lumangoy. Pag low tide, doon sila sa putikan, maglalakad. Kasi mahirap walang bangka, walang ano masasakyan nila. Just because it's okay for them to swim, to go to school, doesn't make it right. It bothered Jay also. That's why when he went to Manila, we continued our communication. I posted lang ako ng ano, ng status sa Facebook na I just came from Sanguanga City and I heard of this inspiring story. So, and daming donors and within one week, nakalikom kami agad ng 70,000 pesos. Nagsimula kami sa isang bangka na malaki na kaya niyang magdala ng mga 25 to 30 kids. Ngayon, sa buong Pilipinas, may mga 154 na, na yellow boats. Yung iba demotor, yung iba walang motor. Ang aming napagawa para sa mga bata at para na rin sa kanilang mga magulang. bilang mga paa namin o mga kamay namin ay hindi kami makalalakad pag wala ito. Yung wala pa kaming nabigyan ng banta na malaki, yung mga anak namin kung papunta doon sa school, sa talon-talon, lumalangoy pa rin sila. If they continue convincing their kids or encouraging their kids to go to school, things can change. Naging simple na yung bayanihan. So ang daming tumutulong dito, school supplies, tapos marami pang iba, katulad ng mga medical dental missions. Sa mababoy, sa mabasbate, nakapagpatayo kami ng uh, isang skwelahan. Masaya po kami yung nabigyan na kami ng bagong pag-asa. Yun, palagi na kami dito sa eskwela, hindi na kami lumalangoy yung katulad ng dati tapos hindi na kami nalilay. Nung nagkaroon po kami ng bagong bangka, nagkaroon kami ng bagong pag-asa. Ang Pilipinas ay may 7,107 islands. Hindi po hadlang layo ng isla sa sunod na isla para maging bayani. We hope that uh, by giving them this boat, it will not only transport the kids from point A to point B, or not only give them a boat to transport their produce, but really sort of give them a new hope in life. Thank you. Um, so to date, we've given close to 5,000 boats already, and uh, 
we're present in around 210 communities as you can you know the philippines uh, is an archipelago so we found uh, a lot of other islands where uh, you know coastal communities or river communities would need uh, the boats uh, you know so the students can get to school or actually after typhoon yolanda we launch uh, what's known as adapt a fisherman project where in uh, you know we replace the boats of uh, the fishermen who lost their livelihood boats because of the super typhoon um, so to date we i would say half of the boats that we've given are for those fishermen who lost their boats in uh, davao uh, sambuanga and uh, uh, parts of uh, visayas that were affected by uh, different typhoons. Um, and so this is uh, a photo that I took in Masbate back in 2011. So it's uh, donated by, um, that, that I, I would say that's part of why uh, our story in a way, uh, you know, spread or went viral because we were, uh, that we allowed the donors to name the boat. So this was one class uh, in De La Salle College of St. Benil who donated uh, a boat back in 2011. Um, and so to date, uh, we, we, uh, today what I wanted to share with you was that uh, when, when, we, when we create projects or when we look into, uh, you know, the, the possible uh, sustainability of a project, we should look at it from a perspective of, uh, you know, the human-centered design framework. And, you know, so of course at that time uh, when I was starting the Yellow Boat, uh, I wasn't really very familiar um, with all these concepts, but uh, now I realize that you know it's very important, especially during the the age that we live in. Um, the community needs to feel that they've been heard or that they feel part uh, of the solution of the creating of the solution, and then they they'll be more sort of uh, you know receptive towards uh, taking ownership of the project. And so in in uh, we've been able to expand because uh, I feel like I have. Uh, Doc Anton and I feel like we have, you know, 200 uh, co-founders because in each community, um, we have sort of a community leader, we call them hoop paddlers, uh, because they are the ones who drive, uh, you know, sort of the change that needs to happen there. So, for example, in my hometown of Cotabato City, uh, Jeff, uh, he, he was my high school classmate. Uh, and he's now a radio broadcaster and, you know, in his line of work, he sees all these, uh, you know, uh, stories of uh, struggles uh, in different communities. And so uh, he found this community as well where children needed the boat so that they can cross, uh, you know, rivers to get to school. Um, so I think it's very important that, you know, we, we in, in, in the sustainability frameworks that we're using, it's very important as well to start with the people. And you know to ask them to involve them in the process and we all know i think the venn diagram of innovation which is you know it has to be desirable meaning the 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 people that will use it actually need it um and then feasible um do we have you know the right uh, do we have the technology or the tools to create it or develop it um and then of course for me uh, this has been the struggle for you know for yellow boat for many organizations up to this day um, the viability aspect, we have to look at it uh, from the perspective of how are, uh, you know, how do we sustain this effort? So like with Yellow Boat, our goal is really for them to take ownership because, you know, the boats would last six to 10 years. And our hope is that, you know, at the end of that uh, six to 10 years, they've either saved enough uh, to be able to, you know, build another boat or you know that the, the the mechanism in play uh, has been in place that you know kids don't really need to swim to school because either you know there's a school nearer to them already or you know uh, some other solution uh, you know sort of has been uh, has been done um, and so for for the last eleven years uh, and I, I you know I I shared this uh, with the Dela Salipa community as well. Um, it's very important. I think one of our realization, uh, there, there's a lot of talk about sustainability, about the triple bottom line. There's even, you know, the quadruple uh, bottom line. Uh, but I think in a, in, a, in a nutshell, what it really means is make something the planet needs. So for Yellow Boat, uh, we know that, you know, the, the, the building of the, uh, the boats, which is uh, marine plywood, uh, does contribute to you know uh, 
some sort of uh, we need to make it you know more environment or planet friendly. So we over the last uh, I think five six years we've been looking at alternative materials, uh, but so far uh, even fiberglass which were uh, heavily used uh, after Typhoon Yolanda, it's still not as environment friendly and actually a lot of fishermen that does don't like the fiberglass boats so we're still looking uh we we've, we've looked at uh bamboo plywood uh but it's still the 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 sturdiness and you know the 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 structure of the bamboo plywood is not there yet in terms of you know uh, making the boats really last for a long time um but for me it's important that you know even though we haven't really created you know uh the actual solution it's very important for uh schools and organizations to take this mindset of uh we couldn't forget we shouldn't forget you know that the planet needs uh the the planet needs also need to be part of the of the solution so it can't just be you know one sided and that's why we keep uh, hearing about you know the concepts of collective impact of uh you know uh, again sustainability because uh, i think there are uh, three levels to it there's the personal sustainability um so the social innovators the social entrepreneurs uh need to find uh, sustainability because everybody pays rent bills etc and then of course the organization uh needs to find sustainability as well in terms of, like for yellow boat uh we're 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 uh sort of engaging a lot of our community leaders to look at being able to create social enterprises so in Sambuanga, for example uh some we've created uh, uh we've created a sort of a segment wherein uh, the boats are used for ecotourism of course it's not heavily used now uh because of the restrictions on travel but um, the boats are used to ferry tourists around uh, the Santa Cruz Island, which is the pink, known as the Pink Beach. Um, and the community owns the cooperative. So the LG, we got the LGU, we got uh, other stakeholders involved. But the, the organization that does it is uh, completely sort of disassociated from Yellow Boat. Uh, do we do advise them? Um, and so they created, uh, they formed their own cooperative around, you know, sort of these ecotourism boats. Um, so, but I, again, it's very important for us to look at the planetary requirements as well. So it's not just the sustainability of the individual and the institution, but also the planet. Um, and and I think this is an evolving, you know, this is an evolving uh, process. Uh, so the three key lessons that I want to share with you, uh, I think in my last uh, three or four slides, um, the first one I shared earlier, the technology can be harnessed for social change. I think it's very incumbent upon us uh, you know so like in in i'm i'm a very uh, uh how how would i say this i i'm I've, i'm an absorber of new technology so i i love to you know i i i love to play with like virtual reality and you know blockchain all these things but i realized that it has to be a conscious effort to 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 look at using this technologies and how they can you know sort of help uh communities and how to help the planet um, but we shouldn't forget, and this is uh, the second lesson that I wanted to share, uh, it is our humanity that sustains our change. So it doesn't mean that, you know, you put up a Facebook uh, page, you website, uh, you know, that people will just naturally come. So when uh, I remember when Yellow Boat was starting, uh, I had to meet uh, a lot of the donors, the first donors face to face over coffee, over lunch. Uh, many of them I had to call, you know, and explain what the project was all about. So we have to realize that technology is just an enabler, but it is our humanity that sustains the change. And that's why I think we, though we chanced upon, you know, this model, I think it's very important to have uh, community leaders, uh, you know, the, so even in schools, for example, if the capstone projects and, you know, the research projects, if it's targeted to help a particular community, then they should have a seat at the table because, you know, once they have ownership of the project, then they can, you know, they feel, they feel in a way compelled to continue it because they are a part, uh, you know, they, they own part of the process to make it a reality. And of course, third, uh, I've realized because of the project is that people without hope won't take action. So 
you know, even even by sh- just sharing an article, by just sharing a, a powerful story, uh, it can have a big impact. And, you know, I think everybody's familiar with the ripple effect. Um, in, in my story, for example, it started with a Facebook post uh, that was shared many times. And then it started with one boat. And now we have uh, 5,000 boats. We built bridges. We built, uh, I think we're, we built around... 10 to 15 uh, uh, schools already, which are, uh, you know, two to three classrooms per uh, school building. Um, and, you know, we've, we've built a dormitory in Sambuanga, Sibugay. The kids have to walk uh, five hours to get to their school. So uh, it, it serves like a halfway house. Um, of course, a lot of that uh, are uh, on hold uh, uh, during this COVID-19 restriction. So we shifted towards uh, providing printers, uh, you know, so that our uh, teachers can print the modules and lesson plans and distribute it to their communities. So again, it's very important to be uh, agile and to be flexible as well and to respond uh, to the current challenges. Um, and so in the la- in this last, uh, you know, 10 to 11 years, I came up with this uh, theory of hope, uh, which I uh, which I call it's like a template for 21st uh, century learning, and I, I believe um, it's very important for schools to uh, you know sort of become more conscious of this today because you know with the face uh, with a with a fast pace of change, uh, you know I I uh, I can't keep up actually with a lot of these new tools that get created. You know, there's 3D printing. Uh, it's you know you can now print an entire house uh, using these big machines, for example, and you know it can be used for socialized housing. But I think it's very important for us to uh, you know go back to the fundamentals. And for me, uh, what is the fundamental thing to look into here is um, so I gave hope its operational meaning, um, and so it starts with H, which is harnessing your potential. Um, and for me. Any innovation or any project should start with the problem. You know, what is it the problem that uh, in a way uh, I would describe it nags at you, you know, that disturbs you, that keeps you awake at night. And, you know, you're, you're, you're excited to go out there in the world and solve them. Uh, and for me, even, you know, with the, with the research, uh, with the research work that schools do, capstone thesis, etc., it has to be designed that way. We're in. If we want the you know students and uh, and Lasallian partners and faculty to create solutions that are you know in a way sustainable over the long term, then it has to start with a problem that you know the, I would call this as it 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 looks or it seems counterintuitive, but it has to be a problem that you've fallen in love with. That you know, like in, in Yellow Boat, for example. We, if we fell in love with the boat, with the yellow boat, then we wouldn't go to, you know, providing printers, providing uh, other solutions. Uh, but of course, the problem that we're trying to solve is really, you know, getting, giving kids an education in a way, or you know, getting them to school, which is a transportation or accessibility challenge. So because we fell in love with the problem, we do everything to solve that problem. So we, uh, because sometimes, you know, we we fall in love with the solution when it's no longer, uh, you know, working for that particular uh, problem. So again, it's very important, uh, I think, to start with the problem. And then uh, the formula there is to find, uh, you know, if is to figure out your strength and your weaknesses and then work with people who can complement you. So I think it's very important, and I, I'll go to you know the second element that's important here and start with with O. Um, uh, this used to be open your heart and mind, uh, but Doc Anton told me, Jay, parang it's hard to act on it or it's very vague. And so he said, why don't you use wallet? Uh, because again, once you feel you found a problem that you want to solve in the world, once you you know, how would you know if someone is really in love, uh, you know, or if, if someone is really um, serious about something? It's because they're willing to open their wallet. So it's about, you know, finding your few soulmates or partners to make it happen or finding the resources, doing an asset inventory. Um, and so for me, it's very important for us that, you know, uh, I, I in fundraising, I'd, I'd like to share this, that there's a concept of if you want, if you want money, 
ask for advice. If you want, if you want money, uh, if you want advice, ask for money. And you know, I, I've learned that that's very true in this uh, whole process. But uh, again, uh, my point here is that once you've found a problem that you want to solve, then you have to open your your wallet and you know just go out there uh, and engage with people and see uh, what possible solutions can be created. And then, of course, the next element, P, is about perspiring or taking action. I believe it was Thomas Edison who said, everything in life is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So in, in the yellow boat, for example, it took us five months to build the very first boat because, you know, this this wasn't, you know, just any boat. It, it had to accommodate 20 kids. You know, it was like really a you know, school bus and water. And then it had to have a flat bottom uh, because the, the mangrove area uh, actually was, uh, you know, uh, even during high tide, uh, I think there were just four or six feet of water. And, you know, if it, if it was shaped as, you know, the triangle bottom, uh, it would really scrape through the corals. Um, so I, so it took five months to sort of, you know, do a lot of the prototyping. But in our second community in Masbate, it just took us two weeks to build the first boat because we already knew, you know, the profile of the right, right boat builder, uh, where to buy the raw materials, the bronze nail, the marine plywood, etc. So it's important na, uh, for us, I, I, I couldn't emphasize this enough that, you know, prototyping is probably the most important step in in any uh, you know in any project today whether it's a social innovation project or even if it's a sustainability project because we need to you know we need to test out whether it's working or not um and then you know e for me which is the last element e is about empowering others um and it's about you know teaching others sharing it um in the last 11 years we've seen uh, you know, other organizations copy what Yellow Boat is doing. They also give boats for kids and for uh, fishermen who lost their boats because of a disaster. But for us, that's nice because, you know, it means that um, we're able to help more people. Um, so I think we also need to change our thinking around this. Of course, maybe if we're, we were a business, we would uh, look at it differently. But because we are in the social innovation space or in the social enterprise space, uh, we love to be copied uh, because it means, you know, uh, the, our solution in a way works and, you know, it gets, uh, it gets adapted and in, improved upon by others. Um, and so, so there you have it for me. Uh, it's, a simple, uh, it's a simple theory on how we can operationalize hope, uh, especially during this time. Because, uh, you know, for the longest time, I, I, I kept, uh, you know, hearing that, you know, we need hope, we need... Uh, this, but it's very hard to uh, you know make it actionable, and I hope that you know this this sharing on the theory of hope would be something that uh, you know you you would help you uh, as you do your work. Um, and so uh, I, I end with that. No, I end with that note uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the this uh, the sharing. But for me, uh, I wanted to end uh, with this uh, operating philosophy. Uh, that we use uh, in the yellow boat. It's actually credited to Mother Teresa uh, and it's actually printed on our official receipt. So when you donate, it's printed there um, and it goes like this. Uh, the great thing a little lamp can do, which the big sun cannot do, is give light at night. It shows us that no one is superior by size, but by purpose. If we cannot do great things, we can surely do small things in a great way. Because little things make a big difference to God. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much for that, Jay. Okay, so now if there are any questions from the audience, the floor is now open for any questions. Okay, so let me just... So this was a really inspiring story, Jay. So how do you see Yellow Boat Foundation in the coming years, in the next five years? While we're waiting for questions from our audience. Uh, thank you. Um, so that that's actually a really good question. So for for us uh, during this COVID nineteen pandemic, we had to shift towards uh, you know a different mode. So instead of the usual mm -hmm. boat building or infrastructure building, uh, we raised funds for the provision of uh, computers and printers um, to the different communities. So uh, once face to face is allowed again. 
uh, I imagine we would continue, you know, the uh, some part, the boat building and the infrastructure building. So we we build uh, again. We we for the communities that we've adapted, we build, we augment um, their uh, their school buildings or their classroom buildings. Of course, uh, all that is made possible because of. Uh, the donations that are given to us. So, uh, but we haven't really found, you know, uh, again, part of the challenge for any charity or, uh, you know, uh, small to medium size charity or nonprofit in the Philippines or even globally to is really sustainability of uh, the enterprise. So we're looking at ways on how to um, really, you know, inspire the community. So in, in, in two cases, in the 200, I think in, in Cebu and in Tambuanga, we, we already have like, you know, sort of a social enterprise where in the boats are used for, you know, a business, uh, which is, again, more ecotourism related. Um, and then so they are able to augment their income uh, in terms of, uh, you know, using the boat. So we that's for me, that's how I see my role personally uh, over the next five to ten years. It's really how do we. Um, engage these communities so that they think towards, uh, you know, creating a more sustainable solutions themselves. And and I think one of the things that made Yellow Boat successful is that we always saw it as a, you know, sort of a stop gap uh, solution. Um, and it's, you know, sort of, it's sort of like the four piece of the government, you know, the for, uh, the Pantawid uh, Familia program we're in, you know, it, it, so that they won't go hungry for this time. But we know that a long-term solution uh, would eventually need to uh, be found. Um, so I, I just uh, to, to cut the sort of make it simpler, the answer there is really to continue engaging the community and uh, make them realize that the, the long-term solution is, is something that should come up from the community. Because again, we want them to own uh, their story. And of course, as uh, I mentioned this in the past, um, I'm not particularly, you know, I'm based now in Manila. So uh, even if my hometown is Cotabato, I rarely go home. Um, and so my, my high school classmate who's the team lead there, he's the one who sees the community. He's the one who knows the needs. So he he's in a better position to sort of, you know, help the community decide on next steps. But again, the goal really here is to uh, build sustainability both you know, for uh, for the planet and for the or but also for the organization and of course for the individuals involved. Thank you. I, I hope um, I was able to answer your. Yeah, yeah, question. yeah, yeah. It's a uh, I know very uh, something that we want to uh, know watch, of course, in the coming years. Yeah, I'd like to call on Raymond. I think he has a question for you. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Thanks, Jay, for the. First, for the presentation, but more importantly, for actually setting up the foundation. Years Thank ago. you. Uh, my question has to do with sustainability. Uh, does the foundation have a long-term scientific tracer study in mind so that uh, you can quantify the socioeconomic benefits of having the children not drop out of school so that you can then say to future potential donors that for every peso it goes into the foundation, then you have some kind of a multiplier effect. Uh, of course, through the improvement of the lives of the students and their families when they grow up eventually. Uh, thank you, sir. No, that's uh, that's a really good question. So it's all actually always on our mind as well. I think uh, uh, we we haven't done any sort of uh, you know comprehensive study or uh, research into you know the like really quantifying the the sort of the all the benefits that we've done over the last 10, 11 years. Uh, but we do track uh, enrollment, attendance. Uh, I think at the basic, that's what we track. Uh, so we actually, spend, because most of our communities are uh, far-flung and, you know, you could say depressed communities. So most of them, uh, actually because of us, we are able to introduce them to the four piece as well. So as part of the tracking of the SWD, uh, but they need to attend, uh, there's an enrollment and attendance target. So it's it sort of, we loop them in so that, you know, it's a more holistic approach. But again, uh, we haven't done any study. I think we'll, we, we are looking into it, but uh, I think someone needs to uh, sort of fund 
uh, that study with us. But again, we are uh, you, you know monitoring those uh, th that data. Uh, for the first community in Sambuanga, we uh, we had uh, 11, 12 college scholars uh that uh, you know that from that first community who are and i would say that 10 uh 10 are working now uh around the philippines and then two are actually working uh abroad uh you know from from initially using the boats uh when they were in in uh grade school or high school uh they were able to graduate uh, we got them scholarships from the state universities there but again i think from from our end um to be able to do that uh, we probably need uh, you know, an expert person to guide us how to to go about it. But we we do want um, something of that nature to be done so that we can really measure and then we can really look at you know how these kinds of solution can be can be scaled. Because uh, as a note, uh, you know, when when I worked for Philippine Business for Social Progress uh, a few years back, um, I actually found out that in in the 1990s, you know, so before Yellow Boat. They already gave boats to you know some kids in Mindanao um, so that they can cross rivers. So the, the idea wasn't really unique, but I guess you know they they did they didn't brand it. Uh, there was no follow up. Uh, so I think yeah, so, uh, studies like this would help uh, the project more, especially especially even up to this day we keep hearing how can we export this concept to Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, or even Kenya as far as Kenya. Um, so yeah, I, I I think we would be open to you know someone uh, helping us do a study like that. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Jay. Jay, I know that you have a meeting at nine o'clock, but we have a few more questions. I'm I'm wondering if you can stay on for a few more minutes, or do you need yeah, to go? Yeah, I think it's all right. I'll just message them that I'll be a bit late. <laughs> okay, so we have a few questions in the chat box. So the first one comes from Roberto Louis Moran. So if the boats are not being used right now, how are they being maintained? And how has the pandemic affected the boat drivers right now? Yes, uh, th that's a really good question. So right now, uh, it's, since it's assigned to the barangay or the school, uh, of course, there is a segment of the work that we give it out to the fishermen who lost their boats. So right now, it's really... So when we donate the boats, that's why we donate it. Uh, we prefer... For the school boats, we don't give it out to the families or the kids. It's really given to the barangay and the school, and they're the ones who uh, maintain the upkeep. Uh, so for, for those that were given to the schools and the... Uh, uh, you know the barangays they're using it to deliver the the modules that they printed so it's in the care of the community leaders um and then for the for for those that were given to the fathers or to the families that uh you know as a replacement for their boats um it's really for, uh, up to them we sign uh you know we sign a moa with them or an mou were in you know it's said that you know they cannot sell the boat things like that uh, i think in our in our long history 11 years um, you've only had one case where in the fisherman uh, sold the boat because uh, I think they went into a medical emergency. Um, so for the most part, uh, the community do uh, does abide by you know sort of the the terms and conditions of the donation. But of course, we have a mindset, and even we make it clear to the donors that once we give it, it's really you know the uh we it's really the beneficiaries already who who, who maintain the boats. But of course. Uh, we that and and that's why we we need a community leader on the ground. It can't be like me, you know, managing remotely from Manila, uh, because they're the ones who are able to check, uh, you know, the conditions of the boats, the conditions of the communities on a weekly or a monthly basis. Okay, thank you for that, Jay. Um, the next question comes from Eric Kitalig. Can you describe more about the prototype that worked for the yellow boat and which might not work in other contexts? Okay. No. So I think for the boats, no, we we don't actually have a central sort of facility for the boat building because the requirement, the, the boat requirement for each community is very different. So for uh, for a river that's you know really uh, having a strong current, it needs to be you know a bigger boat, sturdier, uh, and then it needs to be motorized. Uh, there are uh, small rivers wherein you you know they can just paddle around. Uh, so that's smaller boats and, and you know you can accommodate just five to uh, six people uh, at a time but we have you know really big boats so in karamo one we have those are that's the area where we have the really big boats because 
it's a mobile classroom so it's the teacher uh the, he she he is an alternative learning teacher and he goes to um you know i think he has a schedule of like three times a week in a different island and uh, i think there's multi grade there like grade one to grade three is uh, just looped in in one uh, class um so it depends on the community the boats um, you know that we build depend per community and so that's why the community uh person is very important because they're the ones who can uh, help figure out the you know what kind of uh, boat is really needed per community so we do a lot of uh, we do a lot of prototyping uh, uh in 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 uh you know in each community and i think the the lesson there is really more on uh we're able to figure out the profile of the route right boat builder so that we know that you know when we when we ask someone to build the boats they're they're you know open to new ideas because you know there are some boat builders that you know want to make it the way they've been making it for the longest time which might not necessarily work for for our requirements okay thanks for that um the next question comes from professor biswajit sarkar who's from yonsei university in korea so he's inquiring what are the problems that you faced in the collection of funds for the yellow boat foundation uh, well, I, I actually now uh, I don't see you know initially when we didn't have you know a name and we we, we weren't formally registered, uh, it was hard. Um, and to me personally, I also have a hard time you know sort of accepting the funds on a personal uh, level. We used to like Doc and I uh, during the first year we had to you know sort of give our personal account. Uh, and when when it became really big, uh, we had to register. Uh, we had friends who, you know, donated the initial uh, sort of capital to set up the foundation. Um, but again, it's very important, uh, you know, it's very important that we use these digital tools. I think now it's it's easier. You know, we have uh, we have uh, our local versions of. I think in uh, in uh, is it uh, he's from Korea, no? The Yonsei. Yeah, so uh, yes, it's, like cow, it's like a cow pay. We have a lot of those in the Philippines now, Gcash, Paymaya. So a lot of, the, especially the small donations go through this digital wallet, uh, you know, so platforms. But we still get a lot of donations through our uh, bank accounts. We do have corporate partnerships um, that, you know, sort of give on, a, on an annual basis. Um, but of course... Uh, that's not enough to really. So I, I think part of I forgot to mention part of uh, uh, the when I, uh, the yellow boat today is a hundred percent volunteer driven. So Doc Anton and I do this on uh, you know uh, on a volunteer basis, and so as all the community leaders. That's why we have you know other <laughs> regular jobs. But I think for our setup it works because you know I'm not the one building the boats. Uh, I'm not there in the community. Uh, so I don't really need, you know, eight hours of every day to do it. Um, but again, we do it for the community itself. We do want at some point for them to find a more sustainable uh, form of uh, structure to be in place. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next question comes from Brother Joe, Joe Scheiter. Uh, maybe you can give a comment on his um question so there are typhoons frequently demolishing bamboo homes so in manila north harbor there are many unused steel shipping containers about 20 or 40 feet long could they be used as emergency housing so the web has many pictures of what can be done um, maybe um, is the yellow boat foundation also looking at this like maybe making use of uh, materials that were initially disposed of and repurposing them into uh, something more useful um, thank you, brother Joe. Uh, yeah, we 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 are uh, per se we are not into housing, but we uh, I think if you are interested to pursue that, uh, there's a an organization called City Hub. Uh, they use uh, shipping containers to build uh, dormitories for migrant workers uh, in Manila. I think they now have four locations. Uh, so what they do is they talk to uh, landowners with uh, you know idle land in Manila. And they convert them into uh, living spaces for uh, migrant workers. I think they charge, I think, one thousand five hundred per per month. Uh, you know, and and there's aircon, there's free internet access, and uh, uh, bathroom facilities. Uh, and most construction workers, or what they call mig migrant workers uh, in Metro Manila, uh, have have begun uh, paying uh, for their services. I, I would say that. Um, there are organizations now that can uh, potentially use 
uh, shipping containers and convert them into emerging uh, em emergency housing. But I think um, uh, the hard part there is really, uh, you know, getting uh, the, uh, the land where it will be put up. Uh, so for City Hub, what they found working for them is they talk to these landowners who have all the land and then they do a revenue sharing. So they don't rent the land, um, but what they do is share uh, you know, uh, the revenue if there are, um, because they try to also keep the, the services, uh, the, the cost of the services very low. But I would say, uh, because we, we, you know, that's not our core area of expertise, but we can, yeah, we, 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 there are uh, people in the space who are able to do that if uh, that's something that you would want to uh, you know, pursue. Okay, thank you so much, Jay. I think that's all for the questions. And I hope you can share with us your uh, PowerPoint presentation and maybe if you can include your contact details just in case others would want to reach out to you and ask uh, more questions after this webinar. I hope that would be okay. Uh, yes, you. I'll share the presentation slide with you and maybe you can share it uh, with everyone. And yeah, you uh, any, everyone can always... Uh, I see that Sir Tony Ingles is here. Um, thank you, Sir Tony. Um, I, uh, I'm always, you know, you can always reach me at uh, j at yellowboat.org. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this morning. But before we end uh, this session, I'd like to promote our lecture, our sixth lecture. Okay, so it, it will be a slight, there will be a slight change in our schedule because our speaker for June will be coming from Palestine. So he'll talk about indigenous knowledge and practices for sustainability in difficult circumstances. Palestine is an example. We'll have Professor Mazin Kumsie on June 30, 2021. So that's still a Wednesday, but instead of having it in the morning, we'll have it in the evening. So that's 7 p.m. Philippine Standard Time, so 7 to 8. So for those of you who are interested, please register at bit.ly slash DLSU06, or you can scan the QR code, which takes you right to the registration uh, page. Okay, so I'll be sending you guys email again as a reminder on our next lectures. And uh, for those of you who are interested to view our past lectures, you can find us on YouTube at DLSU Sustainability Lecture Series. That's bit.ly slash sust lectures, or you can scan the QR code um, here on the screen. Okay, so let me check. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. And I hope I'll see you again next month for our sixth lecture. Have a good day for those of you in the Philippines, for those elsewhere. Good afternoon or good evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Jay. Jay, thank you. Thank you.